call upon Rev. Tzvika Reisman to lead us in the recitation of a few kapitlach tehillim. Please rise. Mizmor le David, Halinoi, Miyagubu Alecha, Mishkan Bakochecha. Oilech Tomim Bufuel Sedek, Zuberemes Bilbo. No regal al Shano, Rasal Rego, Eher Pado Nasal Kirbo. Mibzo Beinav Nimas. וסירי אדינו יכבד, נשבר להרע ולא ימיר. כספו לא נסון בשנשך, ושכל ענוקי לא לקח, עושו אלה לא ימות לא ילום. מזמור לדוף בי אדינו רואי לא יחסום, בנוס דשא ירביצני, על מי מנוחות ינעלני. נפשי נשבב ינחני במעגלי צדק למען שמו, גם כי אלה בגיא צלמוות לא יראו כי אתו עמודי. שיב תכו משם תכו הם ינחמוני, תאור לפני שולחן נגד צהריי. דישון טוב השם אין ראשי כסי רבויו, אך טוי וחסד הרדיפוני כה ימי חיי, ושבתי בבית סדינוי לאורך יומים. We turned on our phones after Yontif, after a very difficult Yontif. And we read the news, the very difficult news. We also heard some more difficult news. The passing of a great woman, Mrs. Betty Jacobowitz. Racha Sima Basrib Shlema. A truly inspirational woman. I didn't have the schuss to meet her, but I can tell you that I was inspired by learning about her, about learning who she was and what she stood for. I felt inspired learning about growing up in the shadow of Talmidei Chachamim, in the shadows of Balei Chesed, and how that truly shaped who she was, an incredible Balas Chesed, a kind, compassionate, giving person who treated everyone like they were truly part of her family. I learned about her experiences in the Holocaust where she looked Mengele in the face at least three occasions, and she survived. With incredible siyata dishmaya, she survived the war, and together with her husband, who she loved dearly, who she respected so much, they built themselves into beautiful people beautiful couple. I learned how she didn't always have it easy in life. There were some hiccups along the road, but she never, ever allowed those difficulties, those challenges, and those obstacles to bring her down, just the opposite. She used those as an opportunity to grow. Like royalty, she picked herself up and carried herself with such dignity and pride. I learned how she lived with a mission, a mission to live, a mission dedicated to the Jewish people, a mission to show Hitler Yemach Shemoy that Klal Yisrael is victorious, the Rebbeinu Shalelem runs the world. And look at the Jewish children 
look at the Jewish community, and she would smile, knowing that we won. And she, together with her husband, took that mission very seriously. And they built schools, yeshivas, they built Jewish life in Los Angeles. A true role model for us all, a true matriarch, a true tzaddikis. She should be Melitza Tzioyesher for the entire community and, of course, the entire mishpacha. Bila Hamavis Lanetzach Umocha Hashem Alukim Dim Am Yaakopan. Call upon Shlomo Einhorn to offer words of Hesped. Just befitting to start uh, the, with the words of Aisha Chayel. Uh, certainly, uh, my aunt, Auntie Betty, deserved uh, those words and they felt very appropriate. Aisha Chayel, Miyinsa, Barachach, Bimin Michra, Batach, Bole, Bala, Vashal, Loyach, Sargum, Altatov, Lora, Kolya, Mechaya, Darsha, Tzemer, Ofishtim, Vitas, Vachafetz, Kapea, Isaac, Kanya, Soche, Kamircha, Tavilachma, Vitakamo, Laila, Vitit, and Tervlez of Chokl, and Arsel. Zamos, the Devitiko, Cheo, Mipri, Chapen, at the Chagrabos masnea v'tamad zaraseha tama kitov sachra lo yichbe v'layla nera yadeh shilcha v'kishar v'chapeh tamchu falach kapa kapa varsli ani v'yadeh shilcha v'elon lo sir l'veisa mishalei ki chol veisa l'vu shanim marvadi masala sheish v'argaman l'vuta l'vu shad nodu b'sharim balo b'shifta imzik ne'aretz sadin asa v'timkor v'chagor nasna l'klani oz v'hada l'vu shad v'tisrak liyom acharon pi aposcha v'chachma v'tores chesed al shono tzafil liches veisa v'lechem Atzus lo sochel, kamu neve ashrua v'ala v'yalua rabbos panos asuchayel v'atalit al kulana sheker achein v'hevel yofi isha yerasa denai hiti salal tenula mi priya dea v'yalua b'shari maseha. Let's Rabbi Kraus to share a few words. Chazal tell us that the last eight psukim of the Torah was questionable who wrote those last eight psukim that speaks about the death of Moshe Rabbeinu. How could Moshe Rabbeinu write about his death? So one opinion is that it was actually Yeshua. Another opinion is is that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Kairi, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told him what to write. U Moshe Kaisev Bidema, Moshe Rabbeinu wrote those eight psukim um, with tears. And however we will explain what it means Moshe wrote those words with tears, Many different interpretations, actual tears, maybe it means another interpretation of Dema. But for Klal Yisrael, throughout the world, wherever there was, wherever there was a Jewish community, wherever there was a Jewish individual, um, when we concluded the Torah, and some Chastaira, Shmini Yatsiris, and Eretz Yisrael, we were Messiah the Torah Bedema. Certainly literal. Dema, the tears, the t thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of tears that were shed for Achenu Bene Yisrael. So one would somehow feel that. In the midst of all of these demois, in the midst of Klal Yisrael mourning the horrific and ongoing horrific atrocities in Eretz Yisrael, uh, we're gathered here uh, to mourn the loss and pay tribute to the loss of a woman, Anisha Chashuva, but who lived a full life left a wonderful family, 
What does it mean? The Torah has a parasha and the end of parasha Shaftim called the parasha of Egla Arufa, where the Torah describes an entire ceremony that is done because of one person that lies dead. And the Mepharshim explain that it's interesting to note that the parasha of Egla Arufa is nestled in between two parashiyas, one before and one after, each one beginning with Kiseitse la Mulchama Aloivecha. And in the time of battle, there are many chalolim, hanim tzoyim ba'adoma. Why would the Torah make such an issue in the midst of a mulchama about ki matzei chalol ba'adoma? Number four, Shem explain, because every neshama, every Jewish life is precious. And the kayim nefesh achas mi Yisrael, Every neshama, every Jewish soul contains an entire world. And what could we say about the nefteres? Isha chashuva, rochasima, bashlema halevi. That not only was she an entire world to her family, but she represented an oila mole, an entire world. A world that many of us are not zeicher to see. Many of us will no longer be zeicher to see members of that lost world. A world of nitzulei hashoya. A world of giboy koyach oisei devoroi lishmoya bekol devoroi. So in spite of the ongoing mourning that we have for the losses in Klal Yisrael, it is important for us to focus on the loss of this Eila Mole and what it means for us. In terms of what the Nefteres meant to her family, I'm sure we'll hear from family members, the Hashivas, and what she meant to this family. But in terms of us, people, members of the community, people who came into contact with her, she represented something very unusual and very special. There's a medrash in Bezai Sabrocha. The medrash says, Bezai Sabrocha. This is the bracha that Moshe Rabbeinu blessed Klal Yisrael lefnei Moisoi. So the Medrash Rabbi says, Mahu lefnei Moisoi. What does it mean, lefnei Moisoi? Rabbonon Amri. The Rabbonon said the following. Ma osa Moshe. What did Moshe do in order to be able to bless Klal Yisrael? He took the Malachamoves and he threw him in front of him. Every attempt at the Malachamoves, the angel of death, made to try to take this Neshama, Moshe Rabbeinu, Heshlichay Lefonov. Amalei Moshe. Moshe said to the Malachamoves, Lech Mikan, leave. I have work to do. I have a family to raise. I have a mission in life. Not only to raise a family and to build a community, but I, Sha'ani Mevakesh Lakalis Laha Kadesh Baruch Hu, I also want to praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Shekosuv Loyomus Ki Echya Vaasapir Maseko. So to us, Next generation, the Nefteres represented a generation that looked the Malachamoves in the eye, as Chazal say with Moshe Rabbeinu, and she 
As the Rev mentioned earlier, she stared down the angel of death because she had a mission, because she had a family to raise. She had her own self-esteem to be able to walk with pride for her entire life. There's an interesting Orechaim HaKodesh, also in this week's parsha, Parsha's V'zayis HaBrocha. The Pesach says, Vayifku B'nei Yisrael, when Moshe Rabbeinu passed away, B'nei Yisrael mourned the loss of Moshe Rabbeinu. We all know the Chazal, by Aaron Ksiv, but by Aaron it says, Kol Beis Yisrael. All of Beis Yisrael mourned. So what's the difference? Why? By Moshe it was Beis Yisrael, by Aaron was Kol Beis Yisrael. So we're familiar with a number of explanations. One, Aaron was an Oyev Sholem, the Roydev Sholem, and he was endeared by all of the people. But then the Arachim says the following, Oyed Ef Sholemar, perhaps one could say, Ki Misas Aaron Hergishosem Biyoser, the death of Aaron rattled the people very much. Lefi, because Shinistalku Anani Hakovit. With the death of Aaron Akoyin, they lost the clouds of glory. Vuhusar Maschoisam, and their protection was removed from them. And even though when Moshe Rabbeinu Chazal say that after a while the Anani Akovit returned in the Schus of Moshe, and when Moshe Rabbeinu was Nifter, they also were removed. But the Rechaim says, when Moshe Rabbeinu died and the Aniyah Kovid were removed, they already saw Eretz Yisrael. The, the Ardain was already in full view. They weren't stranded in the Midbar yet. But with Misas Arin, Arin was their Ananiya Kovid. Arin was their protection. When Arin was Nifter, everyone trembled and it rattled everyone. The Nifteris one can say, was the Anani HaKovit of this family. And maybe all of her fellow Pleite Hashoya were the Anani HaKovit for Klal Yisrael. Chazal say the Anani HaKovit, what did they do? They didn't only envelop the Machni Yisrael in, in a cloud of protection, but as they traveled, they were able to clear all obstacles. If there was a hill, it would clear the hill. If there was a hole, it would fill the hole. If there were scorpions and snakes along the way, they would remove them from their path. The Pleite Hashoya, the Gibayre Koyach, Oyse Devoroi, this oil and mole that the Nefteris represented was of course the Anani Akovit for her family, was there to smooth out all of the challenges in life, to be there as a source of strength, not only to her husband, but to her children and grandchildren as well. But she also taught us, our generation, that if a person carries themselves with dignity, and in spite of the anonym, in spite of the clouds that seem to hang over our people, but there's covet. Hold yourself with respect. Recognize who you are. Recognize that you have a mission. You'll be able to clear all of the obstacles in their path. And that's why one could say that Yiddishkeit, Torah life in America, after World War II, flourished because of the strength and determination of the Anani HaKovids of this generation. The Mara de Astra mentioned earlier that she always carried herself with dignity, with a manner of royalty, which was befitting someone that represented Anani HaKovid. Shleim HaMelech says in Kehelis, 
I praise the dead Shekvar Mesu that are already died. Menachayim Asherhema Chayim Adeno from the living that are still alive. What does Shlema Melech mean? He's Meshabeach the Mesim, better off dead than alive. So the Ksav Sefer has a beautiful pshat. The Ksav Sefer says that many times that people don't really know a, nif- a nifter or nifteris. They don't know a person well enough. And even people who came into contact, you can't really know truly who the person is. But you can see who the person was from the family that they raised. What shevach can I give to the mesim that are no longer here? Look at the chayim, that the, the family that the nefteris left behind, you can get a little bit of a glimpse of who the nefteris was. And Baruch Hashem, Kaddish Baruch blessed her with a beautiful family. I can only say that every time that I had an opportunity to interact with the nefteris, Before you knew it, the conversation turned to her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, all of their accomplishments, because that was the covet that she had in spite of all of the anonym that she experienced. I'll just conclude with a pasuk that most maspidim conclude with. We heard it earlier as well. And I also many times conclude a hesped with these words, um, the words from the Navi Yeshaya. But I believe that this time, um, the words of the Navi Yeshaya ring loud and clear for all of us at this time. The Navi Yeshaya says, he's mispalo for a time when ubila hamovas lenesach, death will be eradicated forever. And Hashem will wipe off the tears from everyone's face. And the shame and the degradation of his people he will remove from the entire land. Ki Hashem Diber. May she be a Melitzas Yosher for Klal Yisrael I'm sure that she'll stand before the Kisei HaKovoid and say um, she was nifter on the day when the atrocities of, of the Nazi era once again reared its ugly head. And we hope that she'll come before the Kisei HaKovoid and say, we've endured enough already. I endured enough. My generation endured enough. HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's time already that Bila Hamavas Lanesach. That's Rabbi Klein to share a few words. So I'm not standing here on my own right. I'm here as shliach of my dear father-in-law, Rabbi Lo, who couldn't come to the Levi, he's not feeling well. I'm sure send him to the He, as everyone knows, was very, very close in the family, Shver Mashviger, going back Rabbi Isaacson, Rabbitson Isaacson, and it's going back even before Rechasima. My Shvigar is the same name. They're named after the same person. 
the Sigata Rebetzin, that's the Chaim's Rebetzin, it's Bracha Sima. The connection, the, the closeness of the families, the Jacobovitz families, and my Shver's family, the Low family, the Isaacson Mishpacha, is, is something that's indescribable. I want to know what is a real loyal friend, Gary, the Mishpacha. And it all comes, it comes from, from the parents. Like, uh, Gary told me, you know, first of all, to hear from Adam talking about uh, his Shviger, Bruchasim Abbas, Shleima Halevi, the way Gary talks about his Shviger, that. It's, it's, it's something very remarkable and, and very unusual. Always, not just now. He told me a, an amazing story. That I think this story, and I think it's obvious that this story describes who Brachasima Basif Shlema Levi was. But she was in the war, the Holocaust, as we heard before, from the Choshev Rabbanim. And Right after liberation, liberation was around on a Thursday. And everyone came to the soldiers, to the liberators, and everyone had very important necessities that they needed, <coughs> food, clothing, shelter, finding out about the family. Mrs. Jakovic had one thing that she had, that she needed. She needs Thursday, I need candles for Shabbos, Nader Shabbos. That's what was in her mind. That was her mission. That was her request. It's one thing. I want one thing. I want to go back and light Shabbos candles. And she got it. Like throughout her life. Something she wanted. She had a mission and she was able to get it. Years later, around 25 years ago, she was involved in a car accident, and she was in, not in a good shape. Doctor said she's not going to be able to walk anymore. Of course, she was able to push to fight through that too. Danana Yakovit, that cloud. She also pushed through with with covet, with on with dignity. But that came Thursday, came Friday, came th with the accident that happened on a Thursday, and she was in a lot of pain. She needed surgery. And they, they put her on morphine to, to, to take away, to give her a painkiller that shouldn't be so in so much in so much pain. And the doctor said that she'll probably she'll be sleeping for a couple of days till at least Sunday night. And then Friday afternoon, she woke up. Well, that wasn't planned. She woke up. She had a tube in her mouth. She wasn't able to talk. And she said something, and she needs something, and she's asking for something, and they don't understand what she wants. Till her push of a husband, Ishtikagufoy, when they say Ishtikagufoy, he knew what she wants, what she needs. She needs lecht for Shabbos. She needs candles to light a covered Shabbos Kodesh. In her matzav, in her states, under, under the, the strong doses of morphine, in such pain, having a tube down the throat, what, she, what does she need? She wants candles to light Shabbos candles. Obviously, you can't light candles in a, in a hospital room, so Gary got some electric candles, she lit it, and he says that you're able to see her saying something with her mouth, making the bracha. And right after that, she went back to sleep for, a car, for 30 hours or so till Sunday afternoon. This is who she was. <coughs> and when I heard the story, it came to my mind, there's a, there's a Pachadiga story that you know, in, the, in the ghetto, in the Kovna ghetto, in all the ghettos, the way they did it, they took Eden and they locked it up in a couple of blocks, took Eden from many, from a whole city, and they pushed them in, a couple of families in one house. So one of the houses in Covenant had a couple of families there. And then at one point, they used to do these aktsias, the kinder aktsias, that used to round up kids, 
take them the night before, kill them at Hashem. And a rumor went around in town that oh, they're coming, a, a kinder aktsi is coming. So there's a father with a single, with an only child, a ben yochit, grabs his sons, trying to find somewhere, a, pl- a place where he can hide the child to survive. Runs in the street, through the streets, trying to find a place to hide the child. But he was caught and was taken away from them. He comes back home. It's Friday afternoon. Home. Comes back to that apartment that several families were there. And he sees his wife preparing Shabbos candles. He goes over to the candles. He picks them up and he throws them to the ground and says, we're not lighting Shabbos candles. She realized right away what happened. First start crying. Puts herself together, picks up the candles, puts it in, lights, says the bracha, davens for her children. Next door was a great tzaddik, lived at the time, a great tzaddik, Reb Motrich So they said over this, what happened this Friday afternoon, they told it over to Reb Motrich So he said like this, what the father did is pure expression of amunah. Knowing that the Rebbein Shalem does everything. Such an important, now the, especially this time. The Rebbein Shalem did this, not the Nazi, it's not the terrorist, it's the Rebbein Shalem allowing. The terrorist wants, wants to kill us every minute. The Nazi wanted to kill us all the, all the, it's the Rebbein Shalem that did it. And therefore, I'm upset. That anger, that upsetness, that, that shows that I, I, the Rebbein Shalem is real. It's not just something that we say. It's the Rebbein Shalom is an older Rebbein Shalom that allowed this to happen. It's just like a child is upset. Sometimes wants something. is asking the mother. And the mother doesn't want to give it to, to the child. The child gets angry. So he throws a tantrum. Because, you know, you could give it to me. Give it to me. Why don't you give it to me? So the father's anger is an expression of amuna. He then said the mother's level of amuna is so high, I have no words to describe it. This lighting candles, not just another mitzvah. This is the expression of a minute. This was Rachasima Basar Shlema Alevi, her steadfast amuna, the rock solid amuna. Gary told me that a couple of years later, during the riots, the Rodney King riots, she was beaten, she was hit by it. Someone, someone hit her, beat her up. She was beaten badly, and she needed surgery. She was broken, mis- uh, dislocated shoulder and a broken jaw. And they were saying, the doctors were saying then also that she's not going to be able to lift her hands anymore. And she says, it's impossible. I have to lift my grandchildren. I have to lift up my grandchildren. And she pushed through that too. But at that time, when she was going through the surgeries and all the pain and all the, and she was over 70 at the time. And Gary said, it's not fair. Why is this happening to you? You don't deserve this. And she says, never say that. She told him that for, since the Mulchama, every morning I wake up and I know everything that the Rebbein the only way I'm able to get out of bed is because I know everything that the Rebbein does is good. Her benching, the way she benched, till till recently, is something that we should should have sent. Now it's too late. We should have sent schools to go learn how a, what what benching means. It's not just words. We're not just saying words. You're talking to Hashem, you're believing every word of it. That strong emuna. Where did this Where does this come from? We say there's a capital tell that we say now these days a lot. That's what we're asking. Where's our help? Where's our salvation going to come from? And the answer is Ezri That emuna, that our help will come only from Hashem. But what is the hagdama? I'm going to look up at the mountains. What does that mean? Chazal tell us. Where did she get that strong amuna? That that all she's looking for is that lech, because that is Shabbos. That is the amuna. 
knowing that everything, no matter what she went through, she lost her mishpacha, she lost nine siblings, she lost her father, she lost her mother, and the mechama. No, saying, after, saying after that that everything the Rebbe does to me is good. To being in that age, going through all these pain and all that, and to say, don't say I don't deserve it because the Rebbe does everything the Rebbe does is good. Where did she get that? She was so connected to her parents, to her very highly the chashev of her father, Shlomo Wiesel. Shlomo Wiesel was a yid, as a Talmud muvik of the Atzachayim, the the brother of the Satmarov, the Devriyoyal, the older brother of the Devriyoyal, of the Satmarov, the Atzachayim was a Talmud muvik, was connected, Makusha with him in such a strong way that after the Atzachayim was nifter, and then his wife was nifter, he named his child the Brachasima after the Rebetzin, the Sigat Rebetzin. He used to come, when he, li he lived in a town not far from Sigat, he used to come at least once a month to come to the Rebbe and to learn with him and to talk to him and to connect to him. And there was one time that it passed, more than 30 days passed, and it didn't make it, it couldn't, couldn't come, wasn't able to come, couldn't, couldn't get around to it. And I went to sleep, and then he has a dream that that's a Chaim, that's a Chaim was still alive, comes to him and says, Shloyma, I'm waiting for you. I need you. He wakes up. He says, it's a dream. Okay, go back to sleep, turn around. No, the Rebbe is calling me. Middle of the night, gets up, takes his you know, wagon car, whatever he had, whatever means of travel, go, rides into Sigurd in the middle of the night, comes to the Sigurd house, the Atzechaim's house, and sees the light is still on, the lechtel is still on, knocks on the door, and that's Chaim observed, Rav Shloim Mechagavartov, I'm waiting for you. That was, that, that chinuch, that connection to G'day Yisrael, and then later when she and her husband, the Eishas Chayil that she was, going with him to war, supporting him in everything that he was doing. But living with her parents, she, she always used to say, Tate, my mommy is so proud of me, well, I'm so proud of my children, can I know? Because, you know, Azur Bener, the Gemara Zuk, if someone is Zur Bener, and Ner Shabbos doesn't just mean the lighting the Ner, but lighting the Ner the way Baruch Hasim and Basra Shleim lit the Ner, with that Amuna, with that connection, and lighting up the, 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 the house with the, with the Amuna of the Ravayna Shleim. Someone is, is Megadla house, brings in that kind of light in a house, is Havel Leibonim Tamed Chacham, has good children. There's a wonder why her father and mother, his, his Tati and Mami, were so proud of of her children. She was bringing the Messiah, she was bringing that light that she took from her parents, and she brought it in here in LA, and lit up her house here in LA, with that clear amuna, with that clear, with that strong, that mission of bringing in light of the Rebbein Shalom into this world. As, as Rabbi Krau said, only here pursuit is tevis, and hopefully this separation from such a isha chashuva is very temporary, because Mashiach will come, and Tchis Hamaisim shall come back. She with her husband, and all the, all the Maisim will come back to life, and will be zeicha bekurif to be in Beis Hamikdash with Mashiach said kaini b'meiri b'meini omei. I didn't speak uh, earlier when uh, Rabbi Siegelman called me up. I was wanted to be Mekayim with the Maradasra said by saying Eshes Chayel, by saying words, but I wanted to speak at this spot because it was important to me and to the family as well that I'm here as, uh, as a family member. I'm here as a member of the family. My first name, of course, being Shlomo, and uh, we're going to hear a few minutes from Stephen Shlomo. We both carry the name of Shlomo Wiesel, and the second you got up, I was hoping that story would be told because uh, that story is our achrayas of making sure that light of the Asechayim stays on in each our own ways. And in many ways, as Auntie Betty uh, would always insist that uh, the light, that light which could represent so much. Rabbi Krauss mentioned that you see her children and grandchildren, you understand a little bit of who she is. I say you see her grandchildren and you see their smiles and you understand everything of who she was. Everything, each, each one of her grandchildren are, are utter gems. And 
I remember, I think it was seven years ago, Uncle Tino, seven years ago? Middle of Slichus, right as Slichus was starting, uh, we got the call um, to come to Cedars that uh, Uncle Tino, you know, had passed. And this year as uh, Serena was there, and Michael, they were there, morning of Shachris Davening Shmini at Saris to let me know that Auntie Betty had passed. Which was interesting, the only two times that uh, around Tfilis that I remember that anybody had come to me. Uh, that someone had passed, and it's both them. They were so tied to each other in that way that the, that the Yom Narayim season began and ended with them together. And Tibeti came to America leaving war, and there's something so poignant in the fact that she's going back to Eretz Yisrael now, going back that way in a time of war. Uncle Tsinu would have picked up his bags and, and gone right away back to Israel to support soldiers, which meant so much to him, so much of who he was. And Auntie Betty would have packed her bags and gone along with him to support her husband because that's who she was. This was a, a remarkable human being. This was someone that uh, I had to explain to my younger children, it's not your grandmother. I had to explain to them how this works because they didn't understand how someone could be that age and so close to them and not be their grandmother. We try, when we have a spadim, to take part, take things that we could take away with us. We talked about lighting Shabbos candles. But what stands out for me and my family is really the hachnasas orchem. The way she was whenever we came over, when anybody walked in the door, you know, everybody, everybody has their yantif that's theirs. And just for me and Auntie Betty, it was Purim to see the way she carried herself, to see the way she made sure you sat down. It wasn't a shalach manas and run. You were expected to sit down. There's going to be food put out. Us and the kids already knew where the not-so-secret candy drawer was that the others didn't seem to know. And she would make sure that you felt at home. And then there was also Beaker Cholim. Our family has such a kara satov in, in the Beaker Cholim that she did for her family to come spend time with my grandmother um, in her last few years when my grandmother wasn't aware necessarily of who was there but to come visit her to push herself to be there Shabbos after Shabbos to say hello and then even to visit my mother she lived for many years to be well to visit my mother four weeks ago to come, to come over to her house to visit my mother and to smile with her and to sit with her and Dibedi was a, a remarkable human being, a remarkable person. They say that for that generation, Hitler, Yamach Shemo, made many of the Shaduchim. Because of that, the next generation saw what it meant to be loyal to your spouse, responsibility, achrayas, dedication. But sometimes the match wasn't perfect. But by these two, that wasn't the case. Hitler had no hand in this. He didn't come anywhere near the two of them. Because you could tell the second they were with each other, the room lit up. I remember my wife and I, when we first got married, we looked at them as sort of a model of what it means, what it means to live together into old age. Now he would stand up the minute Auntie Betty walked in the room and vice versa. This was such an example for everyone, everyone who knew them. The kindness and the sweetness of what it meant for her to see anybody as they approached the front door. You knew the sound and the chime of the doorbell matched perfectly the positivity of what she exuded and who she was. She is the last remaining survivor of the Wiesel family. 13, I believe it's 13 children. I don't know if we have the 13, 13 children they had, and she was the last. And we don't know why HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides who's going to survive last and how long they're going to survive, but you have to assume that it was her love and her positivity that pushed her beyond the years that she was initially given. She was here to raise a family. She was here to raise grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and, and to make sure that all of them, every single one of them, every single one, it's not so simple nowadays, were following in the path of Torah, following in the path of supporting Eretz Yisrael, following in a path that would inspire, each and every one of them would inspire all of us. And that's her legacy. This is not uh, by any means a farewell. 
our Rav Moshe Feinstein writes that why do you have the meaning of putting a rock on a matzeva? He says that he heard once, Rav Moshe writes, he heard once because some people think that when you see the matzeva, matzeva's from tzivas, it's stuck, it's affixed. And we're building, we're adding on it, we're adding on it, there's more and more, it continues. And Tibetan story is going to fan out in so many amazing directions. With each tale yet to be told. So it is a, a great schus to have been given this privilege to be Masped and Tibetan, to hear the great words of some of the Rabbanim here today, and to give this COVID Acharon. I remember when I was speaking at, uh, it was a cousin's event, and uh, she started laughing, and it wasn't one of the jokes I had used yet. And uh, I wanted to find out what she was smiling about, and she said that uh, she had told someone near her that that's my nephew, and that her father, Shlomo Mabizel, would have been proud. And I want everyone to know here that that was my great aunt, and Shlomo Mabizel would have been tremendously proud to see what an amazing, amazing woman she was. Amazing. And may it be an example to everyone in this community. We out call up Stephen Shlomo, also named after Shlomo Wiesel. Shasar Abanim, Shasar Murray, Shasar Mishpacha. The Rabbanim have spoken beautifully tonight about Grandma, said so many amazing things, many things I may repeat, ask for uh, your forgiveness. Uh, but really, I'm not here to describe Grandma. I think Grandma was beyond words. You had to experience Grandma to know Grandma. But I can give you <clears throat> the perspective of the grandchildren. Uh, thank God I was able to contact all of our relatives, all the grandchildren. And we were able to put something together to describe how we saw our grandmother. I wanted to start with the story in Shaftim when Shimshin travels with his parents down to Timna. And it's a famous story. He sees a lion, he sees an Ari. And he attacks the Ari. Pasik says, Hashem, Uma Ein There was this Ruach Hashem upon him. He tears apart the lion. Pasuk tells us, he had no weapon, he had nothing with him. He didn't tell his parents, and Mepharshim explained that they had walked a different direction. He was a Nazir, so he couldn't go through the vineyards. No one knew what he did. A few days later, he returns, and what does he see? A miracle. There's an Adas Devarim Bikviyas Ha'arye Udvash. There's honey inside, growing inside the lion. He then proceeds to go to the city. He proposes this amazing riddle. If not for their deceitful manner, they never would have figured it out, right? And the riddle was, from the eater comes food. And from the strong, from the strength, comes sweetness. Then, when they do figure out the riddle, their answer is very interesting. They finally figure it out on the seventh day. What is it? that is sweeter than honey, and what is it that is stronger than a lion? But that really wasn't his question. His question wasn't about opposites. It wasn't about the strongest. It could have been anything, but they referred to the Devash and the Ari. There's nothing stronger than the Ari, and there's nothing sweeter than the honey. I think the answer is simple. The question is, how is that possible? Why did that occur? Why is that the case? The answer is simple. The Pasuk starts off in Pasuk Vav, Vatitzlach halav ruach Hashem. Uma uma ein biyaday, because someone who has on them ruach Hashem, uma uma ein biyaday, and there is nothing else. It's just them and the Abishter. The result is masuk midvash, and azmeari. You get the strength of a lion coupled with the dvash, the sweetness. We spoke a little bit about what Grandma went through in Auschwitz. I'd like to add a little bit to that, but the point being that only grandma's situation, only someone who has the situation that Shimshin had. But tzitzach ala v'ruach Hashem, umme umme em biyaday. There was nothing else. There was no distraction. There was nothing else to rely on. There was no government to back them. There was just grandma and her neighbor Shabbos. 
There was his grandma and her Yiddishkeit. And from that comes an unbelievable balance of strength and sweetness. The strength we heard a lot about tonight, the physical strength through all of her incidents starting in the war, which of course all came from her upbringing in Teresev with the Hasidim of the Chaim, with the Shleim of Yizel, going through her experience in Auschwitz where she tried to run across. She was stuck in the line, just to elaborate a little bit. She was stuck in the line. She was on the left side because her grandmother, excuse me, her mother was holding her sister's child. Her sister was standing there, her niece was there, her mother was there, and she wanted to stand by their side. But she really was not of that age. She was a young teenager. She could have worked, but she wanted to stay with her mother, her niece, her sister. Finally, her mother pushed her across the line. Man kind, you have to go. She goes once, the Gestapo grabs her and brings her back. She goes back to her mother. Her mother says, you have to go again. She goes again. The Gestapo grabs her and brings her back. Finally, the third time, the Gestapo whips her to the ground and starts to beat her because chas v'shalom, how could she disobey? And then all the way from the back, Mengele screams, Let this dirty, cursed girl go. The Jewish girl, the one that's worth nothing, let her go. What did grandma do with that? What did the Uz of the Ari, the strength of the lion, she didn't throw her near Shabbos in the ground. She reacted with strength. When it came Yom Kippur that year, and they made a feast in the camps, and they enticed all the Yidden to break their fasts, she refused her food. She was told that now because she refused her food, she wouldn't get food for another month. That was the Uz. That was the strength that only in Ma'uma in Biyadai, only when there's nothing else, when there's just the Ruach Hashem, the strength of the Eishas Chayel comes out. She returned to Los Angeles. She had her struggles here. She had the car accident. Once again, she showed her closeness to the Eivishir. She awoke to light her candles. What was unbelievable about this Uz, it wasn't bitter. It wasn't angry. It was vash. It was sweet. It was with dignity. It was with pride. My brother Michael once asked her years ago. I remember sitting there, and Michael said, Grandma, how do you do this? You've gone through so much, so much pain. Bar Hashem, you have children, you have Einaklach, you're Einaklach, but there's so much pain. You wake up every day and you feel your shoulders in pain, your knees are in pain, and you're reminded of what you went through in the camps and after the camps. She couldn't even understand the question. The Ebishter is the Ebishter, the Ebishter is Nargoth, that's it. There's only good. The Ebishter only provides us with the best, and we have to live with that every single day, wake up with that strength and make it dvash, and make it sweet. And Grandma did. She got up every single day, got dressed like she was going to a wedding, no matter how long it took, no matter how many people were waiting in the car. She could have been going to a chumash party, a sitter party, a siyum, a graduation. It doesn't matter. She always looked the same, just in case we had to stop at a wedding on the way. <laughs> but what's amazing about her pride coming out of the war, as the Rabbana mentioned, was that she held on to this Yiddishkeit as her pride. We would walk through the streets, uh, Rabbi Einhorn mentioned, that we used to walk together to Auntie Toby every Shabbos, and then we'd come back to Grandma's house for some fresh fruit with Grandma. But on that walk to Auntie Toby, she stopped every little child, every mother pushing a double stroller, and smiled at them and said, this is what Hitler didn't want, and this is what we got. What was important to her was to continue generations and generations of Yiddishkeit, of Ehrlichkeit, of Frumkeit, of Hasidim, of Atzechayim Hasidim. We all have the Atzechayim on our shelves. Chas v'shulim, you can't move into the house until there's an Atzechayim on the shelf. And that was Grandma's pride. That was her strength coming out of the war, was to see every shul open up, every mikvah open up, and Grandpa with his tzedakah to aid these different endeavors. As grandchildren, we really got to experience the Masuk Midvash. As much as every Yingala on the street experienced it, we got it 10x. There was never pressure. There was never any strings attached. It was only unconditional love, the desire to form a relationship, time spent together. She didn't demand that anyone come to her house on Shabbos afternoon. But we knew that was the place to be with Grandpa's jokes, singing Chai Hashem, singing with Grandma. Grandma was very mocked that we all sing with Grandpa. If we weren't singing, we got the finger. We had to sing. 
it was very important to us to spend time with our grandparents because that was the happiest place on earth, to sit down on the carpet when you're eight years old and your grandmother's in her late 70s and she says, let's play rummy cub. That's special. That's something that you can't recreate. That's something that you remember forever and ever. When the times we used to sleep there for Shabbos, I vividly remember having nightmares, going to grandma's room and her bringing me into her bed. She had the cool beds, right? Like the hospital beds. We always enjoyed that. But um, remember her always being the grandmother no matter the age, no matter how many painkillers were in her system, no matter how little sleep she got that night, she was always up for a journey, anything to be with her children and grandchildren. There was a pinnacle. There was the highest point of grandma's Masak Midvash, and that was her relationship with grandpa. Anyone who's driven down Alta Vista has seen grandma and grandpa walking, and there was only one way they would walk, and that was holding hands. Even at the end, when grandpa was in his wheelchair, grandma would walk beside him. There was not enough room on the sidewalk, but she made room, and she would hold Sinu's hand as they walked down the street, because grandma's life was devoted to grandpa, to the point that it was very difficult for grandpa to work from home. I remember sitting in grandpa's office to see him at work, and every few minutes, Sinu, you must be hungry. Sinu, you must need more cranberry juice. And every time, Baruch Chu, I'm okay, Baruch Chu. By the time we left his office, I kid you not, there would be three or four glasses of cranberry juice full. Grandpa didn't touch that. She was worried maybe the first one didn't taste good. So she brought another and another and another until he drank. Everything in that house was love and happiness and relationship. When you would ask Grandma, what was the secret sauce? How did you and Grandpa develop this relationship? There were three words. You can shake any of the grandchildren in the middle of the night and ask them, what was Grandma and Grandpa's relationship? They'll tell you. Love, honor, respect. Those were the three things that made their relationship what it was. Always, no matter what, Grandma and Grandpa looked at each other on any given Tuesday, like a chas and kala look at each other at a badekin. And that was real, and that was continuous till the day Grandpa left. And since the time Grandpa left, if you ask Grandma, how are you doing? The answer was, as well as I can do without my hubby. How great can I do without my hubby? It is what it is. She put on a smile, she pushed forward, she spent time with the grandkids and the great grandkids. But when Grandpa left, there was a part of her that left because she was so connected to the Abishter. Excuse me, she was so connected to Grandpa. Everything about her life was focused on Grandpa's happiness and Grandpa's well-being. It hurt her terribly to see Grandpa in the hospital, even though she was the one who had spent years and years in the hospital with her tragedies. But for her to see her husband suffering, that was much worse. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the caretakers throughout the years. Daisy, Mickey, who both helped Grandma for over 20 years. Luella, Patty, Carmen, Grandma's doctor for over 25 years, Dr. Frosch. All of you treated Grandma with the utmost respect, the utmost love. She, know, she knew it. She knows it now. She's praying on your behalf, and we appreciate all that you've done for our family. Once we're discussing services for our grandmother, people who devoted their lives to our grandmother, I'd like to quickly thank, on behalf of all the grandchildren, my mother and my Aunt Mira, for every day of their adult life that they spent thinking and acting and doing all that was necessary for grandma and grandpa to make every appointment medical or cosmetic. Every, every Shabbos Suda, the Zephrins were with the Jacobovitzes. I don't know if the Zephrins ever had Sudas with anyone else in the community. It was always grandma and grandpa, always. It's something that we as grandchildren took notice of. We live with it. We've learned the true meaning of Kibbut Ava'im, of what it means to live down the block and a few minutes away from your parents and to literally have your parents on your mind 24 seven, any family vacation was around the grandparents, any activity we did, how is that gonna work for grandma and grandpa? Where will they sit when we do that activity? You can look at the pictures, grandma and grandpa are at every graduation, every party, every mazel tov is with grandma and grandpa there, even in times, challenging times when grandma had her teeth wired shut at my bris, grandma was there because mom and Mira would have it no other way. It was not a simcha without grandma and grandpa. Thank you all for coming tonight, for showing your respect for our wonderful grandmother. 
Pila Amos and Natsach, Umacha Shem, Lakim Dimum, Talkovan. Mollay <laughs> Bavur shimis palalim, yadas koras nishmaso. Began eden tehei menuchoso. Lochein balorachamim. Yastire obeseis eknafov leolamim. Vietroir besrachayimis nishmaso. Adenoi ho nachloso. Sonuach al Mishkova Bishaloim Venaymar Amen. Kur will be at Harmanuchas Wednesday afternoon. Shiva will begin Tuesday morning at 223 South Alta Vista. On Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and Sunday, Minf will be there at 615. We're going to be Malavad Arin towards 2nd. Please allow the media family to exit first. <laughs> 